I'm Elizabeth Searles, archivist at the Institute of Jazz Studies located at Rutgers University, Newark. I'm thrilled to be moderating today's panel in which we'll hear four case studies and then have a discussion on jazz archives. We'll be covering archives from several perspectives and our goal is for everyone here to come away with new insight about how to activate the archives for the benefit of the jazz community. Please hold your questions uh, for our speakers until the end when we're gonna have about 20 minutes for discussion. And we, we really encourage you to participate. We want this to be a conversation um, with everybody. I'm joined today by some very talented and impressive panelists who I'm pleased to introduce. But given our tight schedule, I only have a little time to briefly introduce everyone, so please be sure to read all about them in the program and on their websites. Our first case study is a joint project of Stanford University Libraries and the San Francisco Traditional Jazz Foundation. Presenting on behalf of the project will be Jerry McBride, head librarian at Stanford's Music Library and head of its archive of recorded sound. Jerry's joined by Anna Newman, filmmaker and producer for San Francisco Traditional Jazz Foundation, and Clint Baker, band leader, jazz educator, and curator for the foundation. Please join me in welcoming Jerry, Anna, and Clint. Thank you. So I'm Anna, and uh, I'm happy to be here today. I'm very excited to present the online exhibit that we created by digitizing our archive. The exhibit's called The Great Jazz Revival. And uh, this was a really, really big project. Um, we could not have completed it without partnering with Stanford Libraries. Stanford is just amazing. And uh, we do think that we've been pretty successful in the first year since our launch. Sorry. Um, doesn't want to play, but that's all right. In the first year since our launch, we've had probably 11,000 visitors. We've had many... Um, 64,000 plus page views, and we're one of the top 10 exhibits at the Stanford online exhibit site. So we're just thrilled about that. And I think you're gonna be excited about the things that you can do when you digitize your archive. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Jerry, and he's gonna tell us about you know what we did. Um, well, thank you, it's great to be here today. Uh, the San Francisco Traditional Jazz Foundation has had a long association with Stanford University. The foundation donated its extensive library of books, periodicals, uh, in September of 1991, but it wasn't until 2006 that all the collection was added to the Stanford Library's collection. At that time, we then connect, contacted the foundation, and they generously offered to donate their entire archives and museum in September of 2007. Since we're a library rather than a museum, we included only a few of the museum objects, uh, including Turk Murphy's trombone, which is now held in the Harry Lang Instrument Collection uh, at the Stanford University Music Department. It was a very large collection, consisting of around 600 boxes of material. Making important material from the collection available digitally to the world was the original vision set out by university librarian Michael Keller and the foundation. Uh, next slide. The first step in digitizing an archival collection is processing, organizing, and documenting the materials. For this collection, selection of materials for digitization was done as the collection was being processed, uh, which is slightly different from our usual procedure. The final archival collection, excluding published books, periodicals, and recordings, consisted of 371 boxes. Uh, next slide. A finding aid for the collection is now available to search on the internet at the Online Archive of California, where you can learn about materials that could not be included in the digital exhibit. And you can see here the current finding aid, which consists of sort of a description and a place where you, a search box where you can search for very specific things. And then on the right-hand side, a series of links where you can browse through the entire collection. A sustained effort to finish the processing of the collection began in 2016, next slide, and took two years to complete. Uh, next slide. I'm gonna talk about now about our Spotlight uh, software. Stanford has been at the forefront of developing an open source platform for presenting digital materials in library collections called Spotlight. 
Once materials are in digital form with associated metadata for each item and stored in the Stanford Digital Repository, the digital objects can be uploaded to a spotlight site where curators can create customized exhibit web pages complete with descriptive background information. <laughs> Next. It's also possible to supplement materials from the library's collection with other materials to shape a, a narrative. In addition to the pages written by the curators, there are pages where the viewer can browse through categories of materials set up by the curator. The curator's web page is analogous to walking into a museum room and following the selections of the curator, whereas browse categories are similar to going into the museum storage rooms to see additional materials related to the exhibit. However, unlike a physical museum, the viewer can create searches to find specific items of interest within the spotlight exhibit to match his or her specific interests. The uh, spotlight software sort of has the power of the, the library catalog uh, behind it for doing searches. So next slide. I'd like to talk about uh, copyright issues. Um, one major issue in creating a digital website on jazz is copyright because the vast majority of jazz materials are still under copyright protection. Clearing rights for items took many hours to contact the rights holders to secure their permission. Many times, it is not possible to determine or find the rights holders. These items were made fully available on the site, but will be restricted later if we are notified by a rights holder. With only a couple of exceptions, the rights holders generously gave their permission for us to use the material without uh, royalty payments. And the ones where we did pay royalties were actually quite modest. To make the manuscript arrangements available, we researched the publication dates of the songs. Only those songs published before 1924 are currently freely available worldwide. More will be available each year as they go into the public domain. Uh, next. Websites, are quickly, uh, websites age quickly and become vulnerable to hackers. By using a single platform for all of Stanford's library exhibits, it is much simpler to keep the software up to date, making it possible to migrate hundreds of websites at a time, rather than needing to revise each and every one every time the software is too old or develops uh, security issues. Uh, this will give the a Jazz Foundation exhibit a very long lifespan. Uh, next slide. And these are some uh, links that you can go to if you want to have more information about some of the things that I uh, talked about. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Clint. Thank you, Pharrell. Thank you, Jerry. Um, my uh, association with this collection actually goes back before Stanford. Uh, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and was, knew a lot of the musicians who are um, featured in our collection personally, particularly ones that survived into the 1990s. And so my job was to tell their stories because a lot of these uh, musicians didn't have a chance to pull it together. So the first thing we had to d pull their own collections together. So as, as the collections came in, uh, as Jerry said, it was a big collection. So we, we, many collections had to become one storyline. So we came up with a narrative of how we were going to do it. And the best example of that was how we made films. We made films that uh, kind of told our story. The problem with the idiom of music that we were looking at, the, the great jazz revival, is it's a much maligned, misunderstood uh, jazz idiom that was based on history to begin with. Um, one of the great things about the San Francisco Bay Area is it was the home, it became the home in later life for many uh, great jazz men uh, from the days of New Orleans. For example, Pops Foster lived in San Francisco, Kid Ory, mm -hmm. all these uh, musicians worked in San Francisco. And that environment was created uh, in large part due to the work that Turk Murphy and Lou Waters did in reviving interest in traditional jazz uh, during the swing era. They were, not dissat they were sort of dissatisfied with swing music, so they went along and start went back to the music of Jello Morton and King Oliver, who were the main uh, artists. 
So understanding that, the job was to put together a storyline. So it's what we did. One of the, the best things we had access to, um, and this is partly because of the work that Ricky uh, Riccardi's done at the Armstrong House, was to see how useful scrapbooks were. And there they did a, 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 a scrapbook uh, digitization. And so we decided that that was something we needed to do. It was a big priority. So we started in and... Because that story is a is a story, the first cure the 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 musicians who put the books together, were the ones who uh, tell that story. That's our uh, template. And the other thing we had in our collection that was really uh, amazing that had not really been disseminated was the uh, Turk Murphy's arrangement library. Turk Murphy was a band leader uh, who had a band from the 1940s all the way to the 1980s, and he wrote his arrangements. And we had all of his charts uh, in our library and nobody had really seen them so we were one of the great accomplishments of our uh, project was to get all of that stuff digitized and it was not an easy process um, so between our scrapbooks and the arrangements I think we did a pretty good job of beginning a storyline and we're happy it's all available uh, if you'd seen the collection as it was in the early days it's amazing that we got it done <laughs> Jerry, Jerry, I remember when I first met Jerry, he was horrified <laughs> by the condition of the collection. So I don't know, how, how are we doing on time? We're good. Yeah. Oh, good, okay. So anyway, uh, so we're really happy to have this out for everybody to see, and uh, we hope you will all visit the site and uh, learn about this kind of unusual uh, jazz movement from San Francisco Regional. So, uh, and thank you very much. Good. Uh, Clint, talk real quick about what Hal did. Oh, yeah, we had some people who helped us out a lot. Uh, Hal Smith, one of the great traditional jazz drummers, and I worked very closely on this project. To um, he, he worked with the audio recordings. I did a lot of the work with the photos and the papers, and Hal did a lot of the work with the, um, with the uh, recordings, which were a big project, and for getting metadata for the recordings, figuring out who was playing on them, and that, that was a lot of years, different formats. It was a big part of the thing. We also couldn't have done this uh, project without the guidance, spiritual guidance of Jim Cullum Jr., who passed away, uh, I guess, last year. Mm -hmm. Jim was a good friend to all of us and had the faith in me and, and to make it happen. So a lot of this is dedicated to Jim and one generation back to Chuck Huggins from Seas Candy, who really made them made it possible. And you can see clips of Jim talking about his experiences with Turk uh, in some of the films we made. We have 11 original films that help frame and narrate the exhibit. Great, thank you. Our next case study comes from the New Orleans Jazz Museum, represented by Bailey Badaway, the digital media strategist at the museum. Please join me in welcoming Bailey. Thank you all, it's an honor to be here. Um, so let's jump into it. Um, so in 1948, um, a group of friends met up uh, for the Zulu parade on Mardi Gras day in New Orleans, as New Orleans folks do, and they came up with the idea to form a jazz club. Uh, a few weeks later, they met and the New Orleans Jazz Club was formed. Um, this group organized concerts, um, programs, fundraisers and began collecting artifacts related to New Orleans jazz, um, such as this uh, banjo, this is Steelbred Lacombe's banjo. Um, over the years, they amassed thousands of objects, and in 1961, they opened the first New Orleans Jazz Museum on Dumaine Street in the French Quarter. Um, the Jazz Museum moved a few different times. It moved to the Royal Senesta Hotel and then to another building in the French Quarter. Um, Danny Barker was their curator, for a period of time, and then towards the 1970s, um, it just became too much for them to handle, and they decided to donate it to the Louisiana State Museum, where it still resides today. Um, the New Orleans Jazz Museum is a Louisiana State Museum. Um, then it came time to figure out where to put this massive collection. So it temporarily lived in the Pontabla apartments in the French Quarter, and then... Um, 
Now we are currently in the Mint. So the Mint was built in 1835. Um, it, it functioned as a Mint until 1909. And even while it was a Mint, uh, there was still a musical element to the building because we had a orchestra comprised of Mint employees. Um, this violin is on display in our lobby uh, belonging to their uh, director. Um, so it was a mint. It was um, after that it was decommissioned in 1909. Uh, it served as a prison during the Prohibition era. After that, it became a U.S. Coast Guard receiving station until 1966, when the federal government um, decommissioned that and transferred it to the state of Louisiana. Um, the building was in really bad shape. Um, needed a lot of work. This shows our exhibition gallery space um, back in the 1970s. Here's a side-by-side -side image so you can see today. Um, yeah, so, so renovations were done in the 1970s with plans to turn the building, the Mint, into a museum. Um, then in 1977, our first uh, official jazz curator, Don Marquis, was hired. Um, Don's still with us today. He's 86. Um, he lives in the French Quarter, and some of y'all may know him from his uh, research on Buddy Bolden um, and his book, In Search of Buddy Bolden, First Man of Jazz. So um, Don comes on board. He's sorting through boxes in the Pontabla apartment. Um, construction's finally finished in the early 80s, and Don opens up the first jazz exhibition in the Mint. Um, here's a photo of the archives uh, in the early 90s when Don would have been curator. Um, these are some uh, black masking Indians in, in their full outfits. So um, the exhibit stays on view up until Hurricane Katrina. Um, a lot of the city was damaged in Katrina, but most of the French Quarter was spared thanks to it being on higher elevated ground near the Mississippi River. But we did have a lot of damage to our roof. As you can see here, um, massive part of the roof blew off. So all the jazz exhibit had to be taken out. We didn't have any damage to the collections themselves, but um, it all had to be moved to Baton Rouge. And our director, Greg Lambusi, at the time was director of collections, so he um, was responsible for, for moving that. He was on the ground, you know, in the days right after Katrina, moving all this stuff to, to keep it safe. Um, we collected heavily after Katrina. Here's um, one of Dr. Michael White's clarinets that we have upstairs in our fridge. Um, we, uh, so many people lost. Um, artifacts and, and uh, musical instruments, and um, we felt it was really important to, to um, collect these. Um, this is uh, Gatemouth Brown's fiddle on display right now in our Professor Longhair exhibit. Um, this is Fats Domino's piano. You can see our director, Greg, is in the red. Um, they uh, moved it out of his house in the Ninth Ward, and we uh, fully restored it, and it's on display today. So um, that's our little history of how we, uh, from um, the jazz club to Katrina, and here we are at the Jazz Museum today. Um, today we're, we're open uh, six days a week, Tuesday through Sunday. Um, we're open to the public for research. Um, we do uh, over 365 live concerts a year. Um, we have several permanent and rotating exhibition galleries. Um, this is Louis Armstrong's first cornet that he learned to play on, on permanent display. Um, we have the largest early jazz, New Orleans early jazz archive in the world, um, and the largest collection of New Orleans jazz instruments. Um, and a lot of this is from the New Orleans Jazz Club. Um, we're also home to the Louisiana Historical Center. Um, this space that you're seeing was, um, was built out with um, money that came in after Katrina, after the, some of the damage to the building. Um, nice, beautiful, compact shelving, open to, open to the public. Anyone who has interest in Louisiana history, music, and culture. Um, in 2011, we opened a, a beautiful uh, venue. 
It seats about 200 and everything is recorded, archived and streamed live on Facebook, which is an initiative that um, I launched in 2017. So um, you can check us out on Facebook and watch our shows live for free. Um, it's, it's a beautiful room and um, a lot of the great New Orleans jazz musicians have played there. So I'm the digital strategist at the museum and um, a lot of what I do is uh, go through the collection and find images that are, um, that folks might find interesting to sort of tell the story of our collection. Um, we do a lot of, um, we're, we're on social media every day. Um, we, we get messages from folks from all over the world. Um, this is really how we are activating our archives. Um, we, we love getting messages and um, feedback from all of the folks all over the world who can finally see this stuff. You know, it, it was not until recently that um, we were awarded an IMLS grant to start digitizing this. Um, and we're about two thirds of the way done with that project. Um, with our, we have over 12,000 still images. So um, when I came on board in 2015 and then in 2016 when I started to establish our social media channels, a lot of the stuff I was putting out was not um, largely seen by the public. So um, I feel it's very important to, you know, use accessible language, um, use uh, very clear images, just to, to tell the story that of, of jazz that a lot of people might not have heard before. Um, we've had plenty of musicians, uh, relatives of musicians, come by the museum to um, learn more about their families. This is um, Tad Alexander and uh, his nephew with our director when he came to visit. Um, the great granddaughter of George Bruni's. And um, here we have, uh, this is a Leon Rapolo and a relative of his. So um, I really think that uh, through our digitization process, which is still ongoing, um, I think we learn new things every day from putting this out on the internet. Uh, for everyone to find and easily access. Um, you know, we've, we've learned a lot uh, just through that sort of outsourcing. We've caught a lot of, um, you know, filing errors and, you know, mislabeled things. Or, and we found also a, a lot of new firsthand accounts, you know, when we share, um, you know, second line images and folks are like, I was there, you know, that's a, a potential oral history, uh, you know, second, first-hand account um, that we're, we're uh, equipped to take down. So um, it's come a long way. I tried to give an overview of, uh, you know, where we began and um, we're, we're here in New Orleans. So if y'all um, ever in the area, please come by. Um, our collections can be found online at the Louisiana Digital Library, louisianadigitallibrary.org. Um, we're also in the process of fundraising to build out um, more exhibition areas in the building and also to um, build out a more robust website and um, have our own um, independent digital archive uh, online separate from the uh, Louisiana Digital Library, but um, that's our story, and I'll uh, pass that back to us. Great, thank you, Bailey. All right, now that we've heard two case studies representing more of an organizational and kind of institutional perspective, we're gonna shift our focus to a more personal level in our last two case studies. Our next speaker, Maxine Gordon, is the author of Sophisticated Giant, The Life and Legacy of Dexter Gordon, which you can purchase at the Institute of Jazz Studies table out there. <laughs> Maxine worked for many years as a manager and producer, and as you probably already know, she is the widow of Dexter Gordon and the mother of Woody Louis Armstrong Shaw III. Please join me in welcoming Maxine. 
Okay. They're timing this 10 minutes, so if any of my friends are in here, they are laughing because <laughs> it's 10 minutes. Um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Wayne Winborn. Thank you, Institute of Jazz Studies, where I spent many hours. I, I want to try to focus and talk about two things. And the first thing is, okay, I brought my book, which not just because it's for sale, but, but I want to talk about how I wrote this chapter of the book called Pops. And, and many of you know, of course, that Dexter Gordon played with Louis Armstrong in 1944. And, or maybe you don't know, but now you know. Um, and that's him on the end with the big feet, you know, the closest tenor player. And at an army base, segregated army base, which they played at, in 1944, and I have a chapter called Pops where Dexter talks about Louis Armstrong. He loved Louis Armstrong. He never let anybody say anything but great things about Louis Armstrong. If they tried to say something negative, he said, what did you do when, you know, in, when Governor Faubus wouldn't let the children go in the school in 1959? So, you know, and, and if he had won the Oscar when he was nominated, which he thought he would win, his speech said, I want to thank one person, and that's Louis Armstrong, because without him, there wouldn't be a profession of jazz musician, and I wouldn't be here. So, and so and he was, thought he would win, and anyway. So when I started the research, so this is pre-digital, I knew that they had an archive in Queens, at Queens College, here's what I knew. I knew I had been to the house. I went to the house when it was dedicated as the landmark with Dexter and Art Farmer and all the trumpet players. So I had been there, but I hadn't been to the archive. But I heard about it at Queens College, and I'm a CUNY graduate, so you know we could go and do research. And um, I think I called. In those days, we used to call, <laughs> and I said, "Oh, I'm." I'm Doing this research on Dexter Gordon in 1944, do you have any photos of, the, of him with the band? And this man, Ricky Riccardi, the greatest archivist of all time and the genius behind the Louis Armstrong everything, said, I don't see any listed photos with Dexter's name. He said, but if you come here, I'll pull out everything from 1944. So I, I, we do knew that we knew the time period. So I went to Queens, and then you have to take the train and a bus, and you have to walk. And anyway, it's worth it. So I went there. I met Ricky. So love at first sight. You know, I'm nothing. I want to be him when I grow up. I mean, this guy. You know, you, he looks at a picture and he said, "Oh no, that's." You know, he knows the year who's in the picture. The, my friend saw a photo in a, in a Thai restaurant in Seattle. They, and they, had, they said, oh, Louis Armstrong was so-and-so. I, I was like, let me send this to Ricky. Within five minutes, he said, no, it's Jonah Jones. <laughs> you know, and who else was in the photo and what year? So um, the, anyway, that's him. So I went there, and then he pulled out this photo. Oh, we looked at photos. It was a box. And said, by year, 44. And so I was like, well, we have a photo of Dexter because there he is. You, you know, he's a, you can't miss Dexter. He's the tallest, handsomest, and, big, and he got the biggest feet, right? <laughs> and he put, so we looked at the, I said, like, oh, this is great. I can work with this. And then I said, well, who's the girl singer? And could we used to use the word girl, okay, singer. And he gave me the look. I, I don't know if any of you know the look when you are like the dumbest person in the room. It's like, it, it's like, you know, when you don't know if it's Wynton Kelly or Red Garland and you say, who's the piano player? And they give you the look like, why is she here? You know, so he gave me the look and he was like, it's Velma. I was like, uh, Velma? <laughs> Thelma who? Because I'm a bebop girl. So I had never, this is the truth, I had never heard of Velma Middleton. Okay, so you all have to forgive me because my next book is about Velma Middleton. Okay. <laughs> so I looked at the phone and then, you know, I fell in love with Velma Middleton. And so I started doing research. You know, why don't I know who this is? And then, of course, Ricky pulled out like, 
I think I had to finish the book, and then I moved on to Velma, didn't I? But I gave a talk in New Orleans on Velma. I, I've been three times to Satchmo Fest, first with the book, then Velma, and then uh, Louis Armstrong when he was king of the Zulos in 1948. Nine, okay, 14, see? Um, and then I started looking at research on Velma. And now, of course, their archive, thanks to Mr. Smith, is digitized. I mean, this, the archivist is here. Where is she? Where? Sarah. Sarah, the, the genius archivist. So I don't know how many people in the room are archivists, so, but I hate for you to raise your hands. Are there many archivists in this room besides us? Uh, yeah, I didn't mean you, no, <laughs> but, um, you know, we come to be archivists in different paths. You know, we can go to library school, we can study to be archivists, but I am an archivist. I call myself an archivist because I was trained by one of the genius archivists, Annie Keebler who was archivist of the Duke Ellington collection. She was at the Institute for Jazz Studies. Unfortunately, she's no longer with us. And she, how many minutes have I had done? Okay, okay, because I'm, thank you. You've got five minutes. I have five, okay. Annie Keebler was, well, I mean, she was beyond great. And she did the Mary Lou Williams collection at Rutgers. And what she did was take these rolls of brown paper and she put, you know, the big rolls of brown paper, wrapping paper, and she had them on three walls of her workroom. And then she started with the collection boxes, and Mary Lou never threw anything away. I mean, she had every receipt for every pair of shoes. It's one of the great collections. If you ever can go there and look at the Mary Lou Williams collection after you look at the Louis Armstrong collection, or the same day, um, it's unbelievable, but she, had boxes and boxes, and she started with the brown paper. And I went there and I was like, oh, that's a really good idea. And so I said, you know, I was thinking about library school. I was already in graduate school at NYU. She said, no, you know, it's about digital. <laughs> I want you to learn this hands on, you know, put on the gloves and let's see what's here. And so there are three Dexter Gordon collections in the Library of Congress. So, you know, the recorded sound took two years to do the, it takes time. And um, so I learned from her. But then, after five minutes, um, what has happened now is that, you know, we're not obsolete, like some people think we are. And so we've learned that, yes, we want everything digitized so people all over the world have access to all this great information and this history that has been in boxes, luckily, because as we well know, the Count Basie's music was, uh -oh, low, low battery, was sitting at the curb until Milt Hinton put it in his car and saved it. So, you know, that in another hour, the garbage would have come. And he, it's not the only story we know about the Ralph Ellison record collection was at the curb and it was saved. So, you know, don't throw anything away. <laughs> this is my motto. We are not hoarders, we are collectors. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we're, you know, I, I understand that we're on this level of archivist collector, we now are talking digital. And so I'm very fortunate because my son, who's named for Louis Armstrong and Woody Shaw, is, uh, well, you know, it doesn't sound right if you call your son a genius, but the guy's like a media smart guy went to Harvard. Okay, so uh, this is our next project, which I'll, if I can turn it around here without messing up. Can I do this so you can see it? Okay. I know it's only a little iPad, but you can come and see it later. This is what we do now. This, can you see it? Barely, right? Okay, but I'll tell you. It's, this is a Woody Shaw streaming archive. It has all his audio, all his video, all his unreleased, all his master classes, um, interviews, you know, with Mulgrew Miller, and you know, it's, he put together a streaming archive, and it's an app. And you can go to the App Store, put in Woody Shaw, and buy the app, and download 
All these performances that are owned, never been released, were owned by us or got permission from the companies of the release to put on here. So the next project, oh, timer. The next project will be, of course, the Dexter Gordon streaming archive. And all my research will also be available because this book, okay, I know it's 10 minutes. Oh, you're good. Okay, the book I wrote <clears throat> until my editor, the genius, said, this book is now gonna be 900 pages. So he said that might not be the best idea, but my PhD advisor was Robin Kelly and his Monk book was 800 pages. So I thought, well, if Monk has 800, you know, I, I, but my editor said, why don't you cut it back so people could read your book on the subway? You know, that was his idea, and I'm born in New York, so every time my girlfriend, who lives in Harlem, but she works on Wall Street, sees someone reading my book on the subway, which she does, she takes a picture, she said, my friend wrote that book, can I take your picture? And because he was right about this, you know, that people make Dexter accessible, make jazz open, <clears throat> to more people, but, but the research that's not in here, we will make available to that, because I want other people to write books, you know, about Dexter and about Louis Armstrong, and, and so, but this guy, okay, I'm ending now, right? This guy, there's no book without this guy, because Ricky Riccardi, the, the guy, because it's not just the Louis Armstrong chapter, which is many people say, you know, they write to you and they say, it's my favorite chapter. I mean, many people. They, I didn't know that about the relationship with Dexter and Louis Armstrong. But the way he approaches the items, every letter, every photo, every like thing there is, is about Louis Armstrong with so much passion and so much love for him is what that led me to how I wrote the book. You know, that because when I first started the book, I was gonna leave myself out of the book. I was like, no, I'm just gonna write his biography. But then when I put myself in it, it made it the book Dexter wanted. But anyway, thank you, Ricky. I'm done. Thank, thank you, Maxine. <laughs> <laughs> right, can we? Okay. <laughs> All right, our fourth and final case study will be presented by the great vocalist Catherine Russell and her husband and manager, Paul Kahn. Catherine's latest album, Alone Together, is nominated for a Grammy this year. Yeah. Thank you. So, I didn't, oh. oh, I was just gonna say, please welcome me, or please join me in welcoming Paul and Catherine, but you just welcomed her, so. <laughs> Thanks, know, Catherine. 10 minutes, I'm fair. Um, so, you know, I didn't know I was an archivist until uh, I started cleaning out my mother's apartment in her declining years and realized that uh, she kept everything Good. and my father kept everything. So, uh, yeah, and that's me, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in, a, in a moment of this person that's picking me up is very intimidating right now. <laughs> I can't do anything because I'm, I'm supposed to be a well-behaved little girl. So uh, that's, uh, that was that. And um, so we have a series of um, photos. We have photos, we have audio that, that is, is only in our collection. And thanks to Paul Kahn, um, he has digitized uh, a lot of the uh, collection and did it very quickly after my mother's passing in 2013. And so uh, the first two slides, uh, now my uh, career really, the, I'm a traditional jazz artist, so um, my career is based on archives. It's based on history, it's based on who played on the recording, what year was it done, uh, you know, all of this, and, and it makes me so happy also because it, in, in archiving, you develop a family. So now, Ricky is my family, Elizabeth is my, Maxine is my family, I just met all these other folks, and it's a, it's a joyous thing, because we do live in the present. We, you know, people think, uh, and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, Clint made a good point uh, the other day on a, on a call, which was that uh, we are not relics. Archives are not 
uh, you know, ancient Grecian, you know, <laughs> well, jazz is alive, and as soon as the tune is over, that's archiving, you know yeah, what I mean? Right. You go back and see who's played on the tune or whatever, you know. And so, uh, so archiving is a very uh, real thing. So uh, we just brought a sampling of some of the collection of photos from m both of my parents' archives. So this is the, uh, so you want to oh, I just wanted to say that you've heard of, of uh, mom and pop business. This is literally and figuratively a mom and pop archive. Mm -hmm. Her mom and pop. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this, uh, this is the, uh, uh, International uh, Sweethearts of Rhythm photo in which my mm -hmm. mother is uh, it was all what guitarist it is my mother's the guitarist in this orchestra and uh, it's a swing orchestra from the 1940s all female during the Second World War and uh, okay uh, next slide and is, is that Victoria is it, yeah is okay yeah. and then the next slide I'm just uh, consulting Paul uh, has compiled this. Uh, for me to present to you. So this is a photograph of Victoria Spivy from 1929, uh, Lewis Russell Orchestra house band for both O.K. and Victor during 1929-30, uh, backed Victoria Spivy on Victor sessions. Next slide. And this is a photograph that has been, I grew up looking at this photo on the wall in my parents' uh, apartment. This is Lewis Russell Orchestra with Louis Armstrong, uh, circa 1929. And in this photo, my father, Louis Russell, is to Louis's left. So right if you're looking at it, but he's on the left side of Louis Armstrong right there. And uh, we still uh, possess that framed photo. Next. Teddy Hill. Uh, Louis Russell and Louis Armstrong and Louis Russell made this photo. Uh, this Louis Russell made this photo into a woodblock rubber stamp uh, with an ink pad for reproduction. So we have that as well, and that's one of uh, a few photos. Normally, when you see this photo in a book, Louis Russell uh, is cut off, and it's just Louis Armstrong in the in the photo. I've seen that, and that would be in the Frank Driggs collection, huh. and I'll put that in quotes. Next. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, and, you know, before I realized um, uh, that this, that this uh, archive, massive archive existed, uh, my uh, motivation, uh, as I said, is uh, traditional jazz and, and blues. And uh, so I had recorded songs of these artists before knowing that my parents had worked with them. So it was really interesting for me, to, and it continues to be interesting for me to discover this. And so I recorded a song by the great Cleo Brown, uh, who was known as like the female Fats Waller, fabulous pianist and vocalist. And uh, so this is a photo. Um, Cleo Brown uh, performed with Lewis Russell Orchestra and Louis Armstrong in 1937 on the uh, Fleischmann's Yeast uh, recordings, uh, live recordings. And... Um, Yes, so that is the great Cleo Brown. If you're not familiar with her, I please. Should, I should just add that the theme of the photos that we chose to share with you was more or less, Catherine started recording in 2005, and you know she, record, as she mentioned, recorded by a variety of artists from early jazz from the 20s through the 50s. And then we, when we discovered this collection, came across photos of these artists signed to her dad or to her mom. And those are the ones that we chose to just sample here. Um, okay, yeah. uh, next. And this is uh, beautiful Maxine Sullivan, yeah. 1939. And uh, she performed with Louis Russell and Louis Armstrong in the Hollywood film Going Places. And um, I was inspired, you know, Maxine Sullivan is very inspiring to me. And so I, re I recorded a song that she recorded a uh, Harold Arlen, Ted Kohler tune called As Long As I Live, and based on her recording, because I thought she was just a, such a simple and swinging vocalist, just no fluff at all, just you get the melody, you get the words, you know, so that's what inspired me. Okay, next. And this is a photo I think that is only, uh, only we possess, is that, is, that, is that true so far? We don't know if that's true, but... Uh, uh, you can see uh, this is from the Lowe's Theater, New York City, 1941, Louis Armstrong and Billie Holiday. 
And, uh, you know, they didn't do a lot of work together, but of course, Louis Armstrong was uh, w- one of Billie Holiday's uh, favorite artists, and uh, Bessie Smith was the other one. And so you can see in this photo the admiration uh, that they have for one another. So this is a very special photo to us in our collection. Next. Uh, Nat King Cole and Lewis Russell, January 1947, shared a bill for a week at the Earl Theater in Philadelphia. My, my father uh, was not shy about uh, having, you know, t- getting his picture taken with everybody. So it's, it's everybody. I mean, it was fantastic. Uh, next, please. And uh, this is a Philadelphia uh, Press uh, clipping uh, from 1947 from Lewis Russell's scrapbook. Just, so. just to add about uh, her dad's scrapbook, there, there was a big, thick book with tons of newspaper clippings related to his various appearances. In, in, in this case, um, this is just one of the pages with, with previews to this week-long engagement where the Lewis Russell Orchestra shared the bill with the King Cole Trio, and it, it looks like, uh, you know, King Cole Trio was the headliner. Uh, Lewis Russell Orchestra, 16 pieces with a vocalist, probably played first, and th- these are the previews of, of those shows, and there was, a, there was another page which had reviews and said that, you know, well, Lee Richardson, Russell Orchestra vocalist kind of stole the show and all, all the, the girls went crazy. He's the sepia Sinatra. <laughs> and uh, the beautiful thing about digitize these were crumbling, you know, yellowed uh, press clippings and having them digitized, you can, you know, enlarge them. You can, they're, they're, they're malleable and readable and preserved. Great. Next. And uh, this is uh, the great Nellie Lutcher, mm-hmm. um, and signed to my mother, Carlene Ray. And uh, I had grown up hearing Nellie Lutcher's recordings and uh, recorded uh, one of her tunes called You Better Watch Yourself, Bub. <laughs> and uh, so she was a, a fantastic artist, and uh, I just love her uh, recordings. And so we were so excited to find this. Uh, next, please. And this is Lewis Russell. Uh, with Nellie Lutcher and others uh, unidentified uh, folks in this uh, so far. photo. Yeah, there was a, a, a period where um, there, the artists in this era often did shared bills, and uh, at, there was a, a week-long engagement in Baltimore where Nellie Lutcher and her group were on the bill with Lewis Russell's orchestra. And you can see his, uh, his, he's very enamored with her. Uh, <laughs> He was not shy about uh, the ladies, so uh, I don't know what else was going on there, but next. (laughs) So uh, this is Ivory Joe Hunter, signed uh, to my mother, Carlene, and I also covered, I loved Ivory Joe Hunter, and I also covered a tune uh, that he recorded called Don't Leave Me. And so uh, I am now able to, in addition to Louis Armstrong Archive, Institute of Jazz Studies Archive, the Lord Discography, all of the research that is now available uh, really helps me in learning about what I'm already doing and also discovering artists uh, from uh, the, the first part of the 20th century that I wasn't aware of. So we are in the process of digitizing everything, you know, with go, go slow between gigs, whatever we can do. And, but now we have a family, so uh, we, have, uh, we have assistance. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yay. Yeah, Great. Well, thanks to all of our speakers for sharing their case studies. And I just want to say I'm, I'm really glad to be in Catherine Russell's family. That makes me feel really good. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start with one question uh, for our panelists just to kind of get the conversation going. Um, but if, if you want to join the conversation, please do. Uh, there's a microphone here, so we ask that you please come to the microphone to speak. Um, if you have questions for any of our panelists, or if you want to join in um, our conversation with the question, I'm going to ask the panelists now. Um, so just to get started, uh, we've already heard some examples from you all that demonstrate the impact of archives on the jazz community. 
But what are some other ways that archives um, have been giving back to the jazz community? Are they making a positive impact on everybody in the jazz community, or is it just a certain few people? And for our panelists, or anyone in the audience, how have archives contributed to your life in jazz? And please um, say your name also before you. Oh, jeez. <laughs> That's the singer in me to pull it right off the mic stand. Um, my name is Sydney Halpin, and I'm the president of the New Jersey Jazz Society. And I grew up in California, not on the East Coast, so my learning curve when I got involved with the Jazz Society was pretty much bent backwards. And uh, last year, uh, the organization celebrated its 50th Pee Wee Stomp, and if you have not, if you're in this room and you have not been to the archives at Rutgers, at the Jazz Institute, you have missed out. Pick a subject, pick the most obscure name, pick somebody you know, pick somebody you love, walk in there and you will find something. And the gift that it was to me personally, to be able to go through the boxes from stuff that is directly related to the Jazz Society was beyond valuable. And the fact that you guys are so amazingly helpful. I mean, archives can feel intimidating because you really don't know where to start. But this gal right here and her crew that works there do such an amazing job. I can't wait to go online and now go to <laughs> New Orleans and you know find out more about you guys as well. And um, like I said, I can't thank you enough for that. Can't wait till you guys get it all digitized. And then lastly, Paul, what does this do for your book? Well, um, I, I wrote a master's thesis on Lewis Russell and Lewis Armstrong, which you can find online if you search under the title, Call of the Freaks, <laughs> one of uh, Lewis Russell's original hit records. Lewis, uh, Call of the Freaks, Lewis Russell and Lewis Armstrong, musical pals an illustrated history where I've included a bunch of these photos. But now I realize that's a master's thesis. It's not a book. Um, it's long enough to be a book, but I'm, I'm, I'm editing it and revising it using the archive and some other research that's come along. But I will say most of it is digitized and it's shareable on Dropbox or Google Drive. So different researchers out there and friends um, you know, we, we uh, Lewis Russell saved radio recordings um, with Lewis Armstrong. Uh, there was a, a session at the Grand Terrace um, in 1938 in Chicago, and um, I shared those with Ricky Riccardi, and he's going to play one of those tracks on the session that starts at 545. <laughs> it's Lewis Armstrong Orchestra. Check that out. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 it is available. It can be shared, but we're looking for a home for this, and in the meantime, I'm just using it for my own research. Um, and I just want to say that Paul is a graduate of the Masters in Jazz History program from Rutgers Newark. I just had to put the plug in. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so this, 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 was, this was my um, probably third or fourth career. Um, managing Catherine is the, the main career, but in, in my spare time. <laughs> <laughs> Great. We have a... Hi, um, I, my name is John W. Comerford. I'm a producer and jazz presenter, and I have a question for Bailey, but before I ask that question, I wanted to sort of frame my experience as a filmmaker. Um, I made a documentary series about 10 years ago called Icons Among Us Jazz in the Present Tense, and we filmed about um, 135 hours of interviews and 24 hours of film performance, um, all shot on super 16 millimeter film. So in the process of creation of the documentary of sort of a, you know, the living generation of jazz musicians who have now risen to prominence, thankfully we identified a lot through other musicians um, who are the people that we should talk to, um, sort of had a vision and grown an appreciation for the music as it's actually occurring now. And this is one of the themes of the documentary we explore that we're living in history now, although we often look backwards. Um, so with that in mind, um, I was at the uh, New Orleans Museum just recently, and I took in the um, Professor Longhair exhibit, and I was absolutely blown away at it. Because what it did for me was it, um, it really personalized uh, the music in terms of the life lived by that person. 
And I was looking at a few of the photos here and thinking about the lives that are behind these people and all the moments they lived. And in the context of that Professor Longhair um, exhibition, um, there were so many um, amazing firsthand sort of primary uh, elements and descriptions of the difficulty of his life and the obscurity that he fell into and the way that he was sort of resurrected back into the stream of uh, culture in New Orleans and music and literally discovered again. Um, and it just changed forever the way I look at his music and the way I hear it. So how does that come about? How does Professor Longhair become a subject of an exhibition? So that's a great question. And thank you so much um, for sharing that. Um, so right now at the New Orleans Jazz Museum, uh, five years ago, there was basically nothing in the building. We did a small exhibition with um, Ricky Riccardi at the Louis Armstrong House, joint exhibition on Armstrong. Um, other than that, it was just the Mint exhibit. So when our director came along in 2016, um, we hit the ground running and he was like, we got to get this stuff out the archive and put it in the galleries. So um, our music curator, David Cunian, and our director, Greg Lambusi, um, we identified, you know, uh, it was the centennial of Professor Longhair's birth in um, uh, when we opened that, I believe in 2018. So um, that's how that came about. But we're right now, as we continue to fundraise to build out the permanent jazz exhibition, um, we're doing these rotating exhibits, temporary exhibits, um, on specific musicians or, or time periods from our collection. So yeah, that'll be on, on view um, through July of this year. Could I add a little bit uh, to that? Uh, question. I think um, one of the motivations for put, doing our particular collection is because this um, uh, genre of jazz isn't particularly well known or particularly well documented. So that was part of the idea is to bring it to greater public consciousness. Uh, when we were working on some grant applications, they'd ask you, well, what's the significance of the collection? And then you'd have to say, you'd have to go and find places where it's been cited in the literature. Well, it wasn't in the literature. Maybe there was a footnote here or there, but it's really been largely neglected by other researchers. So that was what we were looking at, is to provide research opportunities for people and to bring this music and its history to light. Hi, my name is Lydia Liebman. Um, I'm a publicist and promoter, but I'm also the daughter of Dave Liebman, the saxophonist. And um, my, I really don't have much of a question, honestly. I just wanted to share that I recently went through the archiving process with my father because he gave his archive to Berkeley College of Music. And I have to say that it was probably the most overwhelming experience that I've ever seen my parents go through. Uh, they went through a closet, I mean, no, closet, oh my God, what am I saying? No, a basement, <laughs> like 20 closets, a basement basement full of stuff and there must have been um, they took 50 boxes to Berkeley and there's still like a hundred still in the house in Pennsylvania yeah, cool. and it was um, it was actually really incredible I had no idea what it meant to archive I had no concept of what it how to go through everything and all of it and um, I just wanted to to just uh, tell you all how much I appreciate all of the work that you're doing because I, a lot of people don't really know much about this. When I went to college, I didn't know that Berkeley College of Music had archives for anyone. And Oof. I was there for four years. I just didn't really know. So I, um, I think that it's amazing. And I, I guess maybe one question I, I would have if I did have a question would be if students, now that I'm thinking about it, if students wanted to, you know, is there like a resource or is there a way for um, kind of a, directory almost of a way of where you can kind of see like what colleges or what universities or what places have um, you know specific archives. I know that Sonny Rollins is you know is somewhere. You have my dad in Berkeley, you have Stan Getz there. Is there anything like that that exists or is that like a completely like a ridiculous question? I'd actually like to jump in on this question yeah, because we were we were <laughs> just talking uh, when we were preparing for the panel about how that's always been a dream of mine personally to put that into play. Um, unfortunately other projects have come up and taken priority but I I still fully intend to do that because there, there are, I don't know, there's probably dozen dedicated jazz archives, like the Institute of Jazz Studies, Louis Armstrong House Museum, et cetera. Schoenberg. Um, and the Schoenberg. Schoenberg. Now. Well, yeah, the Schoenberg has it. Now. Now, yes. They have Maxine Sullivan. They have Sunny Wallace. Of course. Of course. Yeah, whole, and and New, York, whole, Public, New York Public Library yeah. has a yeah. huge, 
right. huge jazz collection. That's where Sonny Rollins' papers are. Uh -huh. um, but beyond that, I've come across many jazz collections at universities all over the world. You know, hundreds of archives have very rich jazz holdings. And like you said, there's, there's no central place yet to, to discover all those collections. So that's something that I want to personally take away back to the Institute and say, hey, it might be time to actually put this into play. Let us know, because I would love to go through it sometime. They're, they're not all institutional <laughs> but, um, either, right? It's, there's some amazing collections that aren't institutional. When we put our exhibit yeah. together, the Swedish Bunk Johnson Society was a huge contributor, and they had material that we couldn't find anywhere else. And they were so excited to work with us. So I think if there was this portal, there would be a lot of collaboration among the existing archives, and it would definitely help uh, new archives come online more easily as well. There are some tools, and if anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, that uh, bring a lot of archival collections together that I can point you to to search, but it's not just jazz, so. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, but I, what I wanted to say to you, it's so great that you're doing this, you know, and your father's still here. Uh, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> and because it's really easier when they can identify who's in the picture. But um, I, what that but, is true. You I mean, know, sometimes that, he can't identify them all. I, I know that. I know that <laughs> trick. But you know, I had to go to Ricky. But but uh, in terms of learning how to do it, how to do the database, what they want, because you know the Dexter's was like much bigger. Yeah. Um, you know, there are people who will work with you, and there are people who study to be archivists. Unreal. Who, who yeah, have wow. it, Interns, they come for free. I know. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. She came to our house. Yeah. I just, it was the most shocking thing I did not know that was a profession. Yes, she it's was a profession. Incredible. <laughs> anyway. Did you work with Sophia? I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Uh -huh. Anyway, sorry. Okay. You guys are good. Great. Thank you guys for existing. But, you guys okay, are great. Thank you. Oh, no, that was good. That was good. Hey, honey. Hello, Gerald Miller, the New Jazz Agency. So recently, in the last five or ten years, I discovered that there were some archives that possess material which I own the copyright to, oh. which I had loaned to people that had uh, never given it back, really. Uh -huh. And yeah. so when I went to these archives, I would look at the material and they would still have the uh, awareness that it was my own material. Uh -huh. So that's different in the context when you have like autographed pictures that you know were signed to your mother. Um, but more recently, or necessarily in 1996 when Mercer Ellington died, I was asked by the Ellington family, Lena and Paul Ellington, to come in and manage the estate. Hmm. What I had discovered was that there were previous people who had personal relationships with Duke Ellington um, or Mercer Ellington, and they would be given something uh, at a show. And Mercer would be like, yo, could you hold this for me? And yet they would forget to give it back. <laughs> and now those materials have landed in national and international archives as being donated by such and such a person when it wasn't actually theirs to donate. So I'm wondering how you begin to deal with those rights of ownership uh, when stuff is questionable or when it's made aware that, hey, that was really my dad's and they didn't own it or anything like that. Elizabeth? I'm, I'm happy to, to field this one because I've actually dealt with that situation um, personally. and. When somebody comes to you and they say, hey, this is mine and here's the proof, we give it back to them because that's your belonging. You know, we're not here to, to hold on to people's belongings, but we have a number of practices that we follow. Um, in the past, there might have been a little bit more of a gentleman's agreement, but we're trying increasingly to um, make sure that we document all of the agreements that we have with our donors and the people who contribute things to us. And we also try very carefully to, you know, outline what they give us explicitly so that we can, we can trace it and, and document that so that when situations like this unfortunately do occur, we're ready to address them and, and help. And I, I'm sorry to hear that you had that experience. I mean, it's a fact of the matter. I know that when I heard a lot of stories from Mercer in the past about like when the Smithsonian came to get Duke Ellington stuff. It was like an act of Congress to, to allot the $300,000 that they gave him. And then they came, he said they came over to Pop's house and they went through everything. And if you go there, like the Smithsonian is really a great research institution mm -hmm. because they have all this stuff. You can go in, you can touch it, you can feel it, you can go through it. And I just want to thank you because the work that y'all do is all important for everybody, you know, to understand the history and the scope of the music and what it can mean to the future. So thank you all for doing the, the, the hard part, the heavy lifting.
Thank you. Just uh, like to add um, in pr putting this together, the, the first photo of Victoria Spivey, Spivey, um, I did a little search uh, images and uh, discovered that image, which is signed. It, it, it's a, a fairly large uh, image that we digitized, and it's signed to Catherine's dad, Lewis Russell, from Victoria Spivey. Um, I did a search, and a lot of photos came up, and then way down in the search, mm -hmm. under Getty Images, mm -hmm. I found that photo, and you can actually pay for one-time usage of it to Getty Images for $450. Yeah. And I, I was like, hmm, I wonder what the source was. And I looked, it was Michael Oak's archive. Yeah, right. So, you know, like, there are collectors, in, and in going through um, uh, Catherine's folks' archive, you know, I found little notes, you know, from Frank Driggs, and, you know, he borrowed things, and they're in books um, under his name, his collection, and he copied stuff back to us, um, his, his, his people did after he passed away. So... Uh, it's, it's, and I was interested to hear your comments about putting, digitizing, putting things on the website and having to go through the copyright and ownership issues. So the way I'm dealing with it right now is everything in the collection is copyright, Catherine Russell, all rights reserved until somebody, mm -hmm. like Elizabeth said, comes forward, because there, there are photo credits on these photos, and, and someone comes forward and said, we can contact those people and ask permission. Or if they come forward and say, oh, no, we own that, we'll, we'll say, great. I, I know you want to speak, but I just wanted to give an example of, to the, I think I know you. But anyway, to the question about, you know, ownership and who owns and who gives it. When I gave the talk on um, Velma Middleton, thanks to Ricky, in New Orleans, a man in the audience came up and he was like, you know, I was gonna buy this house in the Bronx, and it was kind of in disarray, and I broke in, or I let myself in to look around, and I went upstairs, and I found, I never heard of Velma Middleton, but I found her itineraries, remember, from, was it when she went to Africa? Yeah. yeah. Her real itineraries, the boat, um, what do you call it, steam, when they went on, uh, what's that called, so the ship, the ship thing, and some other original papers in, in the house. And he was like, you know, and the house was for sale, but it, it wasn't very back. And he said, so I took them, right? Because I thought, well, they'll be destroyed. And he said, would you like to see them, right? And I said, yeah, bring them to Rutgers, right? Yeah. And so then they brought them, to, are they with you now? Oh, no, they're, they're with, at the institute, they're and Elizabeth. if the owner ever comes to us and says, those are mine, we well, will talk to them. <laughs> you know, now that I'm writing about Velma, you know, we will try to find her next of kin and involve them. Yeah, but, yeah. but I mean, in terms of the way we work, you know, this guy's a hero. He didn't say he owned it. He said, I found it. What should I do? And we were like, hey, bring it to us, and then we digitized it so we can use it for research. But, I mean, this is something that, you know, to us, this is like some great find. The yeah, Velma yeah. speaking to us, saying, okay, hurry up, write the book, yeah. you know. So, anyway, sorry. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ryan Maloney. I work at the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. Uh, I used to work at the Institute of Jazz Studies and, and helped Annie with... Uh, oh. With the, collect, with the Mary Lou Williams collection as well as a number of other things. And, and at the Jazz Museum, we're doing a lot of our own digitization projects. And it seems like over the last 10 years, this idea of like, let's get all this stuff digitized. We have to do it, we have to do it, which is great. But now we're faced with these massive digital archives, which it's not as if you just put it on a hard drive and it's fine forever. So, uh, it's far from that at what we're learning. Um, so what are you guys doing as far as your long-term planning and funding for the sustainability of these digital archives, especially when we start looking at cloud-based storage and the costs associated with that? Um, it'd be great if we could just put it on a hard drive and be, and it's good forever, but that's really not the case. So. Well, I, I think this is one of the reasons that the foundation that I work with wanted to partner with an institution like Stanford that has the expertise and the technology to minimize those effects. And Jerry, maybe you can talk about some of what 
Stanford is doing? Uh, yes, yeah, so we have a lot of these uh, so-called born digital materials that come to us now for, for archiving. So we take in hard drives and then we uh, copy them over to our digital repository. And that digital repository is actually set up, the main purpose of it originally was for preservation. And so that's where we preserve all of our, our digital objects. And it's a very um, sophisticated, um, well, you can't really call it a facility, but system of backups so that there are multiple backups of that, that material that will preserve those digital items in perpetuity and, and refresh them as, as technology moves on. So um, it it's, uh, takes quite a lot of infrastructure to do that, um, but that's how we're currently doing it now, and that's where um, you know, all the things that we digitized in this project and, and other digital materials that we receive now uh, actually go into that repository. You know, I'm very sorry, but we're going to have to wrap up our session. But oh. I just want to end uh, um, following up on that. I just want to encourage everybody here, make lots of copies and back up <laughs> your digital files. Stand. Because when they're gone, they're gone. Stand. This is an archivist pleading with you. Please, right. please back them up. Because do anything you can to back up your files because that's our archive of the future. And if we don't do that now, we're going to lose it. So thank you, everybody, for coming today. And thanks to our panelists. Yeah.